All right, and welcome to part two of this week's Yawa, where we're going to talk about a lot of your amazing questions. If this is your first time to the channel, we want you to hit the subscribe button. We appreciate it. So things look a little different this morning because this is morning, actually. It is morning. <laughs> we, you know, just got back from our awesome New York trip. Which, if you missed out on some of those details, check out our first video of this week's Yawa because we talked a lot about what that entailed going out to New York. But we're like, we're back. We need to get this Yawa shot so that it can get up and posted for you guys. And so we're morninging it, morninging it, morning it. It's morning. Although they say you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning, drinking all day is not a goal of either of ours. So we are on the coffee. And I would just like to point out, I'm drinking my coffee. Wow, that is a very sexy blue modeled mug you have there. With standing stone kennels. So mm. this, um, and they're all handmade. Get you some. Yeah. So we have these on our website, get you some. And they're all handmade, so they all are just slightly different. The glazing is just a little bit different, um, but they are awesome. Microwave safe, dishwasher safe, all the things that I care about because I love coffee mugs, but I do not like hand washing them. So. Get you some. And then Ethan's drinking out of a really cool. Absolutely. Somebody that knows me quite well, which would be Jess, our trainer, got me a uh, stay cool pigeon mug. <laughs> yeah. So got to drink out of that. But we want to get started answering some questions right away. Right? Or do you have another announcement that I missed? Announcements, announcements, announcements. No, answer some questions. Okay. And FYI, we're pulling all of these questions from YouTube comments. So if you were watching this and you go, man, I really have a question that I want you all to answer for me in the comments below. Yes. So this one is from Matt Eckel. Hey, Hi. Matt. Hi. I am currently training my five and a half month old GSP, the Excellent. place Q. Very nice. I would prefer him to lay down on his bed, but I noticed all of your dogs are standing or sitting. Is this just preference or is there another reason behind why your dogs sit or stand? So this is a really good question. And I think it's one that we didn't necessarily know because again, sometimes things just become second nature for us, just really remote. And I don't even think about, well, would people have a question about this? So I was like, this needs to be answered. So if you're watching some of our puppy training videos, where we're working on place training and just introducing that behavior. So our puppy is super focused on training and they're food motivated and they're ready to work. And we're working on one specific behavior where they're going onto a dog bed. Then I'm marking that behavior. Then I need them to come off of the dog bed fairly quickly so I can get another rep and build and condition the behavior that I'm looking for. Typically, if we're looking at order that we're training puppies in, I've already taught them how to sit. Um, and then they will do a little bit of that, go on the dog bed and then sit because it's also another behavior that they've been rewarded for and they are learning something new. So they're like, well, if I go on the dog bed and I sit, I've been rewarded for sitting before. So I'm going to do that too, you know, <laughs> double my options of getting a food reward. So we haven't worked on teaching them how to lay down yet. So to them, it's not necessarily a behavior that they are like, oh, I'll get on the bed and then I'll lay down as well as we are trying to keep that momentum of the session going. So it's on, off, on, off the bed so that we can mark the behavior we're looking for at that point. As well as when we have some dogs that we're working on things like distance and duration on collar conditioning place on the dog beds, sometimes we're showing just a, such a short amount of the training session in a video that the dogs don't get a chance to just really settle in and lay down. Now, if you watch some of our Instagram stories and see some of the dogs in training, you'll probably see a little bit more of them just laying down and relaxing on probably their bed. Primarily laying down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not necessarily an expectation or personal preference. It's if we're working on place, that's all that I can expect and want out of the dog. I want them to go on their dog bed, stay there. Whether they're sitting, standing, or laying down, it doesn't matter as long as they don't get off the dog bed for me in most situations. Now, when we are teaching dogs how to lay down, which we do a lot of times through free shaping, we actually utilize our dog beds for that free shaping process. Because um, if I'm trying to teach a dog to lay down and I want it to be their idea first, and they're just meandering around the house or meandering around the kennel, sniffing things, um, it's going to take a really long time. It's going to take a lot longer anyhow, for sure. For them to say, well, I'm just going to lay down and relax here because they're busy, especially a lot of the dogs that we're working with. They're working dogs, high drive. They are ready to work and laying down to them. 
at this point, because they haven't learned that it's something they can be rewarded for, doesn't seem like work to them. So if we can contain them on a dog bed, so they can't wander around, so they're collar conditioned, they know how to stay on a dog bed, they go there, and then I just wait them out. And they're eventually going to be like, huh, well, I'm not getting asked to do anything else at this point, and I'm not getting rewarded anymore, so I'm bored, lay down mark that behavior. So then we're free shaping the behavior of them learning to lay down. And then I can transition that laying down behavior off of the dog bed. So once they've gotten really good and consistent at laying down, we free shape that behavior. I've introduced the cue. Then I can eliminate the dog bed and still use the cue on a down in a more open environment. The last thing to really touch on in that, which is an absolutely fantastic tip for people, because we do get people to ask, or people ask a lot of times, how do I teach my dog to lay down? And what Kat just mentioned is is one of the best. It's going to help them to figure it out the fastest and take the least direction from you all the way around, where you're not having to push them down or help them sit and then lay down. Or bait them into a down. Yes. All of those things are eliminated by what Kat just mentioned. Now, the last thing is, if you're going to be doing um, a stay on a dog bed. So either place or kennel or whatever word you're going to use is fine. Um, and they're going to stay there for any extended period of time. You don't 100% have control over what they're doing. So rather than a cued kennel and then down where they may sit up or they may stand up or they may do anything, we're more interested in or more worried about the fact that they are staying in that sectioned off place. That's the key to that. So they're going to sit, they're going to lay down, they're going to stand up, they're going to do all of these things. But as long as they're not leaving there, that is going to be key. When they get more comfortable, they get better at it. It's going to be easier and their natural response is going to go there and lay down. And relax because they're like, well, now I'm here and I need to stay here until I'm released. So I'm just going to get comfy. Lay down. Yep. Great question. So really good question. All right. What do we have next? So this is a question that I wanted to answer because it also got a reply from somebody else on our YouTube channel, which I we think is really, really appreciate cool. That. Yeah. yeah. It's cool when we're going through comments, which we get a lot of comments, so we don't get through them all, all the time. It's a lot, we try, folks. but it's a lot. And we, we appreciate the fact that you love it and everything else, but I'm just saying it's hard to keep up with. It so. is. And so when some of our other fans and subscribers and followers jump in and answer a question or put in their two cents, it's really cool because a lot of times those are things that we've already maybe talked about in another video that you may have missed because let's face it, guys, we put out a lot of content. Ethan actually asked me the other day, he's like, did we do a Yawa or a video on how to pick a trainer? And I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, we (laughs) talk about it a lot. We've talked about it with clients before. We've had phone call conversations about it, but was the camera rolling? I have no idea. And I'm like, so if somebody knows if we've done that, put it in the comments and let us know that we've actually done a video about that because I can't remember. We did. And I found it. Oh yeah. But (laughs) I found it and I pushed on the response already. Okay. But anyway, so it's cool when we see people chiming in and I really like that. So I wanted to answer this question from stairway to seven. Ooh. My 14 week old GSP was really good about letting us know when he needed to go out for the first two weeks we had him. Okay. But now he has learned that we take him out and he has to stop what he's doing if he's caught peeing in the house. Sure. So now he walks and pees at the same time and doesn't even break stride. So it's really hard to catch him. How do I break him of this? He leaves 20 foot streams. Mm. And then um, Mindy Russell had chimed in. Mine is 15 weeks, and I thought he was mostly housebroken. Today he was drinking and popping a squat, peeing at the same time. That said, we have to consider their age still. Laugh out loud, but it is frustrating, I agree. Again, thanks for chiming in, and it just means that there's more than one person struggling with potty training issues with puppies, which is completely normal. Um, Like Mindy said- It's pretty much- 100% the case across the board. If you are struggling with something, you are not the only one. Right. There are not that many things that happen with dogs and pretty much everybody has the same issues. So. And that's why Mindy said, you know, we have to consider their age, which is very true. I mean, we have to have realistic expectations for our puppies, but I would say if your puppy has enough pee for a to be walking stream. a stream or to literally be peeing while they're drinking, they are probably overhydrated. Um, if you think about us, I mean, yeah. Yeah, 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 normally yeah. people say you should drink about a half an ounce of water per pound. So that's a lot of water. 
And if you keep up with that or even one full ounce per pound, you're going to pee constantly and you're going to be struggling to hold it. You're going to take a 20 minute drive into town and you're going to be like, I got to go. I got to pee. And we are adults with fully functional and developed bladders. You think about these little baby puppies that they're tanking on water, probably drinking twice as much water as they need or more. And And with the average dog, they do need more than what people do because of the type of diet they have. Everything that we eat would be considered more of a closer to a raw type diet where it has moisture in the food we're eating. Yeah. Where the dogs are primarily eating kibble and that kibble is dry and dried down for the ability to be able to stay fresh in a bag essentially. And they need a little more water to be able to digest that properly, but you're still looking at two ounces of water per pound per day is kind of a rough demand for what your puppy should be. Um, should need to stay properly hydrated. And most puppies, especially it sounds like your puppies are drinking way more than that. So not necessarily saying, okay, I'm cutting you off, but maybe monitoring when they get access to water and they get what access morning, noon, and evening, and then no extra water throughout the day to try and yeah. curtail some of this. What we um, actually do with our puppies is we have a water bucket outside the the door, basically, they go out to go potty. They get the opportunity to drink water when they come back in. And within reason, there are some puppies that you can tell they're like stuck and they're just tanking and will redirect focus. It's mm-hmm. like, hey, 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 get them pulled away from that. And then if they go back to it, you go, okay, you're really thirsty. If you can pull that focus and they're like, oh yeah, I've, I've had enough water. Then we go inside. And a lot of times I see more of like a competition based drinking. So if If one of our puppies goes out and is drinking and Grandpa Rex comes up and he's like, yeah, I could use a drink and he starts drinking, then that gets the puppy in. Oh, we're drinking. I got to drink more. We're We're going to, yeah, I'm going to just drink and drink and drink. So I usually try and say, hey, let's come back to drinking when Rex is done or pull Rex away. So it's just them thinking about, is this what I really need? Or is it just this cycle that I'm in of drink, drink, drink? Yep. So that's one thing to consider, um, as well as, you know, first right away when your puppy comes home, they may be just slightly overwhelmed at being in their new space and going, I'm not sure about this. I'm a little hesitant. And as they get more bold and confident and comfortable, they're like, Hey, I'm running around. I've got things to do that I'm thinking about. I don't really care if I take time to go to the bathroom because I'm having fun. So that could be another part of this equation as well as UTIs are probably fairly common. This doesn't necessarily sound UTI-ish in a sense that it's just a huge stream. UTI behavior typically is go out pee. Little piddles everywhere. Walk a little bit further and then tinkle, 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 then walk a little bit further, tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. So, um, but those are also things that are pretty prevalent with young puppies. That small infection just gives them that feeling that they, it's kind of like an irritated, uncomfortable feeling. Like I need to pee again. I need to pee again. to go and there's nothing left. So they just drip, drip, drip. So those are things to consider. Um, So I would suggest starting that, not giving them constant access to water and just breaking that cycle if they get into, you know, I'm tanking, I'm tanking, I'm tanking. And then if you're still having other issues, definitely feel free to reach back out, ask some more questions. This would be a great place to get us more information on our Patreon platform, Mm -hmm. which is um, our online dog training platform, which isn't just for dog training either. If you have questions about anything, if you've got questions about potty training, or if you've got questions about hunting or any of those things, that's a great place to ask and where we can have a true conversation because sometimes it takes a little bit of back and forth to find out all the details, all the information, or even a video to see what's actually going on. So we can say, hey, this is the one little thing that I'm seeing that you may have not actually mentioned in an actual conversation. Absolutely. So really good questions and one that lots of people have. All right. Let's see what question do we have next? This is a good question because it relates a little bit with um, our trip that we just took to New York. So good. A little bit. So Nick and I, sorry if I pronounce your last name wrong. Nick Offerman. Got true. Got true. Gautrow. I don't know. Sorry. Like I said, don't know how to pronounce it. Um, When y'all had Sprig, how did y'all increase the distance on his retrieves? Right now, I'm having trouble with it. I don't know if it's confidence or she just doesn't understand. I'm also 14, so I'm learning. So we love helping everyone and definitely kids that are interested in training their dogs themselves and getting really involved. So um, great question. We actually just picked up a little lab puppy. So we're going to be doing some more videos, filling in some of the blanks, which, you know, extending marks is always a good one. Did you want to look at something? Nope. 
I'm just itching my face. <laughs> um, so this was a really good question as well as we just went out and we're helping Bob actually shoot some videos and he's working with a young dog named Dash. Yep. And he's working on extending marks too. And he actually put together a little video drill that'll be coming out on his YouTube channel pretty quick. Yep. The YouTube channel is Lone Duck. You can search it, Lone Duck. He's got a few videos on there now and we help get a couple more that'll be coming out very soon, I know. Um, so I would go and check that out. But essentially what we're doing is we're working out further and further distances and and typically by using some form of a pattern, if you will, in the sense that your bumper thrower, which you're going to need help, you're going to need some assistance. So that assume, all the bumpers don't come from you. Because- yeah, which is a big, which is a big and common issue that people struggle with with extending marks. You know, typically your hand throwing bumpers and they get really ingrained in this. 25 to 30 yard throw range, however far you can throw them, that's where they get stuck and hung up on through conditioning. Well, you have your bird thrower or bumper thrower out in front of you and they don't move, but you continuously back up. So the puppy is used to running to the same area and you're just increasing that So they're throwing a bumper out here and your puppies run into it there. And if they need a little extra help because they get stuck, they, they headed that way, but then they're just here, then you're bumper thrower can throw them another mark that they visually see that pulls them again to that same area. And then once they've done a few retrieves at that distance, you can back up so that you're increasing the distance, but the bumpers are still all falling in the same area. So So it builds confidence. I hope that that makes sense. If it doesn't, I'm definitely going to recommend that you hit up uh, Lone Duck's YouTube channel and then just search through their videos. There's going to be one in there called something to the effect of extending your dog's marks. Something about that. We don't know what the title will be, but it'll be one of their new videos coming out really soon. So Absolutely. that was a really great question. All right. I bet we've got time for one more in this part. Okay. Okay. This one is also good because it relates a little bit back to Lone Duck from Eric Doan. Our question for the upcoming Yawa um, would be the following and plays into your New York trip to Lone Duck. What's the time frame between allowing the pup to acclimate to the new environment and beginning training? And this is from Eric, Genevieve, and Bridget. P.S. We settled on Jackson because they'd asked us for some name ideas. So uh-huh. um, they follow a lot of our stuff and are always chiming in on our Instagram lives and things like that. So I was like, we got to answer one of these questions here. Absolutely. And like I said, we just went out to pick up our new little puppy from New York, um, from Lone Duck. And we are getting ready to shoot a video on the first 24 hours with our puppy being back and explaining, you know, what the expectations are, because that's a big one. Um, we get questions all the time. So if you want to start crate training, can they sleep in bed with you the first night? Well, that's going to set them up for that expectation that I don't need to sleep in my crate. I got to sleep in bed and that was so amazing and comfy and wonderful. I was with my people. And then they're like, wait, what a minute is I'm not going to sleep in this crate this night. I just slept in bed and then they throw a bigger fit than they may have if you had started that crate training right off the bat. But definitely they do need to feel comfortable and acclimate and make sure that, you know, they're ready to start some of that clicker training and things like that. Um, Food motivation is really important. It's important to remember that a lot of these puppies that are coming from litters have only eaten with a litter mate. So feeling comfortable eating separately, we need to make sure that they're comfortable with that. Now this little guy... (laughs) He's a little food monster. He's a food monster. Which is awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. He's going to be clicker training from the get-go because he's ready for that. His age also, you know, he's eight weeks old. He's going to be ready for that. Sometimes people bring puppies home younger, which we've already talked about in other videos about what Mm -hmm. a good age to bring a puppy home is. But, you know, if you're bringing home a six-week-old puppy, which we definitely would say that's not an ideal age to bring a puppy home, um they're probably not going to be ready to start clicker training because they've just barely gotten to the point where they're weaned off of mama at that point and are not super comfortable eating kibble on their own yet. Mm -mm. So definitely there's a few things that go into that equation, but some of those behaviors that we want to really set our puppy up for success with crate training, starting to work on potty training, it's not like we're going to be, oh, well, 
Today is your first day home, so you can pee in the house wherever you feel like it or poop, but we'll start tomorrow with going outside to potty. No, yeah, all of that those, sounds like a great way to screw everything up. Yeah, all of those important things that you're going to want to develop behaviors in your adult dog, those need to all start right away. You know, jumping up on you and biting you. We got to start saying no to those things in the very beginning. And then you can start incorporating some of the more formal training of, you know, clicker training and obedience stuff pretty quickly thereafter. Yeah. Set up what your routine is going to be and have realistic expectations. You know, not everything's going to be perfect day one. Uh, in fact, probably most things are not going to be perfect in day one, but the closer that you can get to what you're going to be doing and what the schedule is going to be moving forward in the beginning, the better off and the faster you're going to get to where you want to be. Great question. Awesome. That's all we have for part two. Yep. So we're going to take a short break here and we'll be back with part three here very soon.